All right. Letting some more folks in the room really quickly. Closing out some of these windows so my computer doesn't overheat and melt down. And I'd like to take this time for sure to welcome all of you in the building. Uh, this is going to be a very, very, very special um, presentation tonight because we have Dorian Jackson in the building. Uh, who is an attorney with expertise in the estate planning field. And he's going to deliver some real jewels in here for us tonight as a community and teach us how to avoid some of the pitfalls that, that I see um, a lot of times when I'm buying properties out here. And that's, you know, families ending up in probate unnecessarily. And mm -hmm. um, Dorian is actually helping my family because I, when I, when I try to, preach about why you don't want to end up in this situation. I'll talk about it from two different angles. One is from the perspective of an investor who buys houses out of probate. Um, I literally have one under contract now in Indianapolis from a gentleman whose brother passed away. And I'm very happy to buy that house because it's going to be something I buy and hold. It's in an area that they still consider quote unquote the hood, but it's going from one black hand to another. And I love that, right? Then on the other side, I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who was a son um, you know, of someone who didn't start on time, right? And that's where Dorian entered the picture in my life. He actually helped my family. He's helping my family now. Uh, he put a will together uh, for my father who was hospitalized. A lot of you guys know about that. And, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of scrambling on the backside, trying to correct some of these issues that truthfully as a family, I think that if we would have had more knowledge, we would have corrected a long time ago, right? If my, I think if my yeah. dad had known what the the consequences could have been um, of not handling it in the right amount of time, he would have taken care of it. But when that time comes, you know, as Dorian, I'm sure, will tell you, it's not usually under your control as to how things are going to go. So you have to have things in place and laid out properly, um, you know, ahead of time. Uh, so before we get started, just a quick, you know, usually I like to go through some current events and news, but Dorian's time is precious, so I'm not going to do that on this one. I do want to remind you guys, please make sure you're following us uh, on Instagram. That is the main social media handle that we use, uh, that we update frequently, and that's just at BuyBackTheBlockLA. If you want to follow us on Twitter as well, it's at BuyingBackLA. Also, uh, look us up on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is BuyBackTheBlockLA. We have all of the replays posted on our youtube channel within 24 to 48 hours after we actually hold the event and we try to keep it to 24 so that means that this one will be on some point tomorrow so uh without further ado i'm not going to talk anymore i'm going to let the expert step into the spotlight and i want to welcome uh my brother dorian jackson who's here uh dorian thank you for being here to, to help educate the community no uh, it's my it's my pleasure and like you said it's it's knowledge that it doesn't really have, we don't even have in our community. So it's one of the reasons why I like doing what I do is being able to help people like us take care of their assets. Because one of the problems is people accumulate all this stuff over life because you're just trying to get it and you don't think about what do I do once I get it. So that's sort of where I come in. So we'll just jump right into this and uh, let well, me do what? the screen Real share. Quick too, before you start, uh, yeah. for any questions that anybody's going to have, I'll be monitoring the chat while Dorian is presenting. So uh, please drop all your questions in there. If you guys know the answer to one of the questions, please don't put it in the chat because I want him to be able to answer those and I don't want people to get confused. So any questions and all questions you have, please drop them in the chat and I'll make sure that he, he gets those at the end of the presentation. All right, so with that, we're gonna jump right in. So this is um, my presentation on the basics of estate planning. Um, this is just sort of to give you the nuts and bolts of what estate planning is and how estate planning works, because I think part of the problem and part of the hesitation to get it done is it seems sort of like this uh, amorphous thing that no one really understands or knows, and that's, that's sort of an impediment for people to get things done. So I hope this sort of demystifies it a little bit and gives you a little bit more knowledge and power. And of course, you'll have my information. So if you guys have any questions or any comments or anything like that, feel free to contact me um, down the line. So 
want to tell you just a little bit about myself so you can understand that you can trust me and you can trust my firm for what we do. Um, I was recognized four times as a rising star by Super Lawyers Magazine. Um, in the legal field, that's a pretty impressive accolade. It's only given to 5% of attorneys in the state. Um, my law firm has five offices. Uh, we're in LA, Riverside, San Bernardino, um, Orange, and San Diego counties. So it's not just you know people in LA County. If you know anyone in any of those counties, we can help them. And in uh, two of those counties, we were uh, rated as the, one of the best probate law firms. Um, two in LA County, one in Torrance and one in LA, and then also in Riverside County. Uh, in addition, we've been A plus rated with the Better Business Bureau since 2018. So basically, we like to say all this not to oppress you, but to impress upon you the fact that we are a name that you can trust. So what is estate planning? That's sort of the, the big question that everyone has. And I think people sort of look at this wrong because people tend to think of estate planning as just what happens after I die. And that's only one of the, the aspects of estate planning. I like to think of estate planning as like a seat with three legs. You have lifetime planning, which is the use and preservation of the property during your life. You have planning for your incapacity, right? Because what happens when you're incapacitated? And, and according to insurance companies, you're more likely to become incapacitated than to die outright. So there's very serious questions that arise. So how is someone gonna take care of your healthcare? How is someone gonna take care of your property if you're incapacitated? Um, and then, of course, obviously, death. How, do you, how are your assets disposed of? Do you want to control how that happens? Or do you want the state to dictate that? And then also you have a state taxation. And given what's going on in Congress right now, that could become much more of an issue because there's a high likelihood that the state taxation threshold is going to come down uh, tremendously. So the number one thing is why, why do we not get this done? What, what are sort of the impediments to estate planning here? One, I think one of the biggest things is people generally don't like dealing with their own mortality. And that's understandable because that's one of the aspects of estate planning and people generally don't like to think about that. We often don't think of ourselves as being in the position at one point in times of our life of needing care, like being disabled or needing long-term care or someone to make medical decisions for you. And then sometimes I think people also believe that we can set this up at any time. So We'll, we'll get news before the end or before I'm incapacitated so I can just go in and get it done. Sometimes that's the case, but quite often that's not. And, and that's part of the reason why uh, getting this done. So it's, it's important to get this done as soon as possible. And that's what we're gonna get into now. So one of the, the things that we have to worry about here is if you don't have an estate plan, the state of California will have one for you. And that's intestate secession, okay? So intestate secession is basically a set of statutes that indicates who gets all of your assets, whether you want them to or not. So you may not be close with certain family members and you may not even want them to receive anything, but if you don't set up your estate, they're going to receive your assets as a matter of law. And in addition, I think one of the other things that's so unfortunate about going to probate is the expense. It costs you so much more money to go to probate than it does to have an estate plan in place. Uh, I think it's about seven to 10 times more expensive to go to probate than to set up a living trust. And just to give you a quick example, let's say you have a $500,000 property in LA County, which any real estate agent will tell you that's low right now, right? If you can find a brand new $500,000 property in LA County, you'd wanna jump on that. So basically with a $500,000 property, you're looking at a probate attorney fee of 13,000, an administrator fee of 13,000, and with expenses, you're, you're probably about 30K in. Right now with my living trust packages, you know, you're talking about you know, anywhere from two to three grand. So you're looking at a difference of $27,000. And that just gives you an example of why it's so much more expensive to go to probate. Not to mention the delays that you're gonna be in court, um, we just filed one uh, last year in uh, October uh, to finish the estate, and we didn't get a hearing date until August of this year. So it, there's a lot of delays, especially with COVID right now. So it's going to take a long time, and then all of your business is going to be out in the street. Everything is public. So you, there's, everything is going to come out. With an estate plan, if, particularly with a trust, you can keep things private. So that's another big thing about having a, your trust in place. Now, the basic estate planning tools are the living trust, power of attorney, advanced healthcare directive, pour over will, 
billfold cards and the case of emergency cards. Those are sort of your, your the staples of your estate planning package. But what's omitted from here, and I want to touch on next, is a will by itself. Having a will by itself isn't really effective. And I want to get into that right now. So when you, most people don't realize when you have a will, a will has to go to probate court. So a lot of people think a will can just do like a trust and go outside of probate court. That's not the case. With a will, you're still in probate court. The only difference is instead of the intestate succession statutes kicking in, you have the will that dictates who gets what. So that's really the only difference with the will, as well as the fact that the will has to be proved. proved. So there's a process of proving the validity of the will. And again, seven to 10 times more expensive going through probate. The delays that we discussed, the public disclosure that we discussed, and they're easily contested. So you, you can end up with a very big problem when you're going through probate court, particularly when family members are not working together and fighting amongst themselves. So having a will by itself is definitely not the most effective way to set up your estate plan. And we're going to walk through the aspects of the effective way to set up the estate plan now. So number one is a living trust. Now, again, what's a living trust? This is one of those terms that just seems very confusing, uh, eumorphous. No one really knows what it is. So I wanted to find a way to explain this to basically anyone. So it just made a lot of sense and it was really simple and easy. So this little chart is basically the key aspects of a living trust. A living trust is basically a fiduciary relationship. It's not a corporation, it's not an LLC. It's a fiduciary relationship where X, who is the trustor, gives property to Y, who is the trustee, who manages said property for the benefit of Z, who is the beneficiary, okay? That's a trust. Now there's several different types of trust, but every single trust has that dynamic. It has to, by law, to be a trust. Now, in a living trust, you, the person who sets up the living trust is X, Y, and Z all at the same time. Now, this may seem sort of like a legal farce, which in, in a certain extent it is, but the reason that we allow this to exist is it really reduces the burden on the probate court, right? So if people are setting up their own estate plans that pass outside of probate and don't require the, the burden of the probate court, that means we reduce taxation, right? Because the courts are paid through taxes. So if we can reduce the burden on the court, we reduce the taxation. So it's basically a public benefit as well to have an estate plan, which is why we sort of let this legal farce exist. Now, and again, if you don't create it now and you end up in a situation where you're in the hospital and you don't have capacity, it's gonna be difficult, if not impossible to do it then. So it's, it's important to get this stuff started as soon as, as soon as you can. Now, the benefits of the living trust as compared to the will or sort of what we discussed, but I'll just run through those again quickly. Way, way, way cheaper. I can't emphasize that enough. You're going to be saving money. And don't even think of it as saving money for yourself. Think of it as saving money for the people you care about. And that's, that's a much better way to look at estate planning, because I find that that motivates people uh, more to get estate planning done. Don't think about yourself and your own mortality. Think about the people that you care about, particularly if you have kids, right? Do you want the, your spouse and your kids to be going through probate after you're gone, or do you want them to have an easy, seamless situation where everything just passes outside of court and you can get, get things done promptly? And that's sort of one of the big benefits of uh, the Living Trust. And, and as I said, there's only 10 probate judges right now um, in LA County and Stanley Moss. There's one more uh, in the val Valley in Antelope. So you have about 10, 11 judges for approximately 10 million plus people in LA County. So the, the delays are ridiculous. Um, in addition, you have the expense, right? So that's going to be more expensive. But here's the other thing that doesn't get touched on enough. And I mentioned this earlier, the incapacity issue, right? Because if anything happens to you and you're incapacitated, which according to the insurance companies is more likely to happen than just straight death, then at that point in time, how is your health care going to be financed? Who is going to make the health care decisions? How is all that stuff going to work? If you don't have your documents in place, you can end up in a situation where they force you to go get a conservatorship. Now, that's going to be a lot more time, a lot more money, and a lot more headache. Okay, so it's really beneficial 
to have the living trust package in place because this allows you to care for someone in the event of incapacity, not to mention the, the privacy and the security. Um, this is another big thing that I find that married couples, particularly with young kids like. Um, I can give you a personal example where I had this one case because I also do litigation involving uh, wills and trusts where the basically the grandparents of both the parents were fighting over the kids because it was a substantial estate. So basically whoever got control of the kids got control of the money. So in those situations, if you don't have a guardianship clause indicating who's gonna be the guardian of your children if you're not here, then this can create a fight, particularly if there's assets between the grandparents to take control over the kids. Um, and as far as real property, if, as far as your personal residence, this is the best way to hold uh, real title. Now, if you have income property, that should be in an LLC and that's a higher level discussion. But as far as personal residence, you want that uh, to be in a trust as well. Now, the way that a trust is created is a two-step process. The first step is getting all the documents executed. That's pretty straightforward. We send you a questionnaire, you fill out the questionnaire, it's gonna have your, all of your assets, so it's gonna be sort of like a financial statement. It's gonna indicate who you want to be your successor trustees. Those are people who you trust to manage your estate once you're gone or incapacitated. Um, and it's gonna have who your beneficiaries are. So that's gonna have like all the key stuff that we use to draft the documentation. Once we get the questionnaire back, then we'll get the documents drafted, okay? That part is pretty straightforward. The asset transfer, depending upon your financial portfolio, can be a little bit more uh, intrinsic. So for example, if you have several assets, then that's gonna be a little bit more work with the, the transfer of assets, because if they're assets that aren't, you know, um, like 401k, things that are tax deductible, or excuse me, not tax deductible, tax deferred, that you don't have to uh, worry about taxation until you pass or something like that, those assets we don't wanna to touch. Everything else we need to put into the trust because that's gonna be the vehicle that passes it on to the next generation. So the asset transfer is where a lot of the work gets done. And this is where some people sort of pull a fast one on, on, on the public. So they'll, they'll tell you, hey, we'll get the documents done really cheap and then we'll charge you hourly for the asset transfer. In that situation, they're doing that because they're gonna make more money on the asset transfer. Now, because I've, I've been through this situation personally because my grandmother created a trust, but she didn't put everything in it. So the last two months of her life, I had to go around putting all of her assets in a trust. I, I do a flat fee where I just include it because it's important to me, if you come to me to get your estate plan done, that at least in that moment in time, all the assets that you had that we had knowledge of, we can put into the estate plan that are supposed to be part of it. And then at least in that point in time, we know everything is protected the way it should be. Um, and that's where the billfold cards come in too for subsequent assets, which we'll, uh, we'll discuss later. Now, the assets also have to be titled in the name of the trustee. And you'll remember, as I said earlier, it's a fiduciary relationship right? So it's not a corporation. It's not an LLC. And a lot of times we'll refer to um, it as the trust in short form, but that's not technically the proper method to think about a trust. So as you see here in the example, this would be the titling of the asset. So it'd be John Smith, trustee of the Smith Family Trust, dated January 1st, 2015. So it's, it's important to remember, it's not an LLC. It's not a corporation. It's a fiduciary relationship. Why it's and this is another reason why it's so important to pick someone you really trust implicitly to be your successor trustee, because they're going to have access to all your assets, all your information, everything. So you want to make sure this is someone that you don't have any problems having access to any of your information or your assets. Now, the next document that's very important is the power of attorney. Now, the power of attorney, this is distinct from the trust in that the trust only deals with the assets that are titled in the trust. Now, let's say, for example, you forgot to put some assets in the trust, or which is more of a common example, let's say at some point in time you refi on your house, right? You refi on your house, and then once you refi on your house, the lender says, hey, we need you to take the property out of the trust. You can't have the property in the trust while you're refiing on your house, right? In that situation, in that situation, they're gonna force you to take the property out of the trust and put the property in your name individually. The problem that happens here 
is that oftentimes people never put it back. Now this happens so frequently that in the last two months, I think I've done six petitions in this very scenario that I told you about. This is how frequently it happens. So this situation is, is why you need the power of attorney um, if the person is still alive. Because with the power of attorney, if they're incapacitated, it allows the attorney in fact to have access and control over the assets and then put them back in the trust or control them for that person's benefit so that any care or any financing of care can be taken care of. So you don't wanna have a trust either by itself. A trust by itself is better than a will by itself, but you always wanna have a package because we're trying to take care of any set of possible events that can occur. So you always have the trust with the power of attorney, okay? And then the next document is also another document that's part of the package. This is the Advanced Healthcare Directive. Now, the Advanced Healthcare Directive, think of it like a power of attorney for healthcare. Basically, with the Advanced Healthcare Directive, this is for someone to make medical decisions on your behalf. So, for example, um, spouses do not have a legal right to make medical decisions for each other. So if your wife gets into an accident, goes in the hospital, she's incapacitated, you do not have a legal right to make medical decisions for your spouse. Now, the hospital may allow you to do that for some period of time, but they also at some period of time will say, do you have an advanced health care directive? We need to see it or you need to go to court and you need to get a conservatorship, okay? And remember, the hospital only cares about themselves. So they're only going to do CYA to cover their bottom line. And what they're worried about is a lawsuit, right? So let's say it's a blended family. Your wife gets into an accident. You're making a decision. Her grown daughter doesn't agree with it. Now the hospital's concerned, right? Because if they make a decision based on what you choose to say and daughter doesn't like it, now they're in a lawsuit. So this is important because most people don't realize that. One spouse has no legal right to make a medical decision for another spouse. Another important thing is for your kids, because we often as parents will think of kids as kids, regardless of how old they are. So for example, I'm 45, my mom still calls me kiddo, and she's going to call me kiddo to the day I die, right? Or to the day she dies, rather, hopefully, <laughs> before me. <laughs> but in any event, she's always going to do that. She changed my diapers. There's nothing that I'm going to be able to do about that. But the point is, at 18, kids are grown under the eyes of the law. So they're no longer children in the eyes of the law, they're adults. So if anything happens to your kids while they're in college, right? If you don't have an advanced healthcare directive, if you don't have a power of attorney, there could be problems there. So this kind of illustrates how important planning is. It's not something to be thinking about once you get married and you have kids. At the very minimum, when you're 18 and you're going to college, you should have the power of attorney and advanced health care directive in place because when you're going to college and you're, you know, you're learning who you are, let's face it, sometimes stupid things happen. And in the event that those things happen, if you don't have the stuff in place, you can end up in a sad situation. And I'll give you another story. Um, this is another personal story. A good friend of mine, her daughter, uh, excuse me, her friend, her best friend rather, died in a car accident really young. She was 24, 25. And her family wanted to get a bunch of her pictures off Facebook and Facebook wouldn't let her. So they couldn't access any of the pictures. And I don't mean just like, you know, kind of doing like a low resolution, just take it off Facebook. I mean, the actual originals that were uploaded that Facebook has at, on their servers. So this is kind of shows you what happens without these documents in place. They're not gonna let you access anything. So Facebook pictures are a small example, but imagine if the person has a bank account with some money in it, or like um, Anton Yellick, the guy who played Chekhov on um, uh, Star Trek, he also died very young. So this is another situation that you have to worry about uh, without having these documents in place. Now, the last one, the big one at least, of the package is the pour over will. So with the pour over will, what we're doing here is in the event that, let's say someone dies and they don't have the assets in the estate, like the refi example that I gave you, this is where the pour over will comes into play. And these are those petitions that I was telling you about. I've done about six of these in the last two months. Unfortunately, with COVID, they're becoming much more popular uh, because people are passing away. But the benefit of the pour over will is that with the pour over will, any assets not titled in the trust, and remember, it's a fiduciary relationship, has to be titled in the name of the fiduciary. Any assets not titled in the fiduciary's name 
can be poured over, which is why we call it a pour over will, into the fiduciary's name via the pour over will. And this is all because of a case that happened in 1993. So this is really important for assets that are over $166,250, which is pretty much almost any piece of developed real property in LA County, right? So it, this is the, the last big document uh, that's part of the estate planning package. So every package, you're gonna have the tr living trust, power of attorney, advanced healthcare directive, and pour over will. Now, the last two that we're gonna discuss are the cards. So billfold cards, think of these like business cards for your trust. Now, remember, I've been harping on this a lot. The trust is not an LLC or a corporation, it's a fiduciary relationship. So the fiduciary relationship requires the assets to be titled in the fiduciary's name. So we give you billfold cards, which are like business cards for your trust. So when you acquire more assets, you can hand the card to the individual and they can now know how to title the assets. So if they have any questions as well, our contact information is on the back so they can call us if they have any questions and we can square that out for them. There's not an additional charge for that one phone call. It's going to be brief, but this is important just going forward. So you make sure that you're titling assets um, in your estate. Now, if you do acquire, you know, several more assets, in particular, several more pieces of real property, we should probably have a higher level discussion because that's more likely when estate taxation issues could crop up. And there may be higher level planning that we have to do in situations like that. Now, in case of emergency cards, so we used to do these uh, printed. Um, we can still do them, but with technology, they've sort of become to a certain extent obsolete. Everyone with the Apple, uh, Apple iPhone has a medical ID and they have a corollary app on Android. So what we're telling clients now, as opposed to giving them the, the cards, we're just instructing them to fill out the medical ID um, information on their iPhone because that can be accessed while the phone is locked and it doesn't require any sort of um, passcode, uh, face scan, thumbprint. It can be looked at while the phone is locked so they can get the information they need. What we're telling our clients to do is to put in there not only who to contact in their phone number and email, but indicate that they have uh, the advanced healthcare directive with that person appointed. So now that they'll, they'll have some sort of information to go on to indicate that um, this individual can make medical decisions on uh, your behalf. So those documents sort of create the, um, the entire um, estate trust plan. So that's sort of the trust package. So the living trust, power, for, excuse me, power of attorney, advanced health care directive, pour over will, billfold cards, and in case of emergency cards. Those are really the key aspects of uh, the living trust package. And just to let everyone know, we have five counties, uh, offices in five counties. So we have plenty of locations to help people out of, out of uh, LA County. So our headquarters is in Torrance in, uh, in LA County, but we have Orange County, San Bernardino, Riverside and San Diego as well. So if you know anyone in any other counties that need any assistance, please feel free to have them contact us. And just to give you the URL, that's where you can come check us out, uh, dljlawfirm.com. We have our website translated into Spanish for our Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters, so they can uh, check that out and get that information that they need. It's also um, accessible for people with disabilities, so we try to make our, our website accessible to every possible place that we can. So if anyone has any other questions, we have a lot of FAQs up there, or you can contact us directly. So with that, I guess we'll uh, turn it over to Mr. Carter for any of the uh, questions that came up on, on the chat. Okay, cool. Yeah, believe it or not, I only got two questions, and they both came from the same person. So uh, this is the first time I have not seen the uh, chat flooded with questions. And I think it might be because some of y'all might not even know what questions to ask, because I know a lot of this is brand new information. It was A lot of it was brand new information for me at one point, obviously, and it, it took me a while to get my head wrapped around, you know, the difference between the trust and the will and things like that. Um, so Larry had a question. He said, if there is no um, AHCD in place, then who makes the decisions for your spouse if the hospital does not allow uh, you, the spouse, to make those decisions? Oh, in, in that situation, um, in, here, let me stop sharing. Um, in, in that situation, if there's no um, uh, advanced healthcare directive in place, 
by law, they have to do the bare minimum to keep the person alive. If there's any elective surgeries that can make the possibility of their life better, they don't have to do those without having uh, the documentation in place. So basically, their only legal job is to keep the person alive. But they don't have to make sure that, you know, if they survive, their life is better. So it's, it's, it's you know, minimal, which is another reason why you want the healthcare directive in place. Because um, I, I've seen situations where without having it in place, the wife thought she was making decisions and then the mother comes in and now the mother's in charge. So it's, it's, uh, it's a sticky situation. Okay. Um, Larry also asked, what is that emergency uh, app for Android? uh i you know what i'll have to look that up i'm not as familiar with android because uh, i have the iphone myself but I, I i do i am aware that they have some sort of corollary app so i can get back to you and uh, find out which one that is but you, you can also just like search um in the uh, google play store if you have android like um uh, medical id app and that should give you a list of some if the Android doesn't have a, a basic one, but I know I've looked it up before and there's several um, similar apps for Android. It's just the Apple one is very convenient because it's embedded into the software generally. You don't have to download an extra app and it comes up and it pops up on the lock screen so you can access it directly. But I think they do the same thing with the Android apps as well. Okay, cool. Um... <clears throat> Let me see. Uh, okay, so Antonio wants to know, if you don't have any properties or major assets yet, how important is it to get these documents? Well, I mean, there's different planning for every person. Every person's plan isn't the same, right? So the person who has 10 pieces of real property, you know, a million dollars in the bank, house, a boat, like that's a different estate plan, right? Than the person who has maybe one home and one income property, and versus a person who has just a residence, right? But as I was saying before, at a very minimum, everyone over 18 should have a power of attorney in advanced healthcare directive. And that was the very reason that Danny contacted me directly because they needed a power of attorney given what was going on uh, with his father because it wasn't done yet. And it was being done at the last minute in the hospital as Danny said. So it, it just makes things more stressful when you're trying to do those at the last minute. Cause believe me, I think I'm a charming guy and I'm a great dude to hang out with, but the last thing that you're going to want to do when you have a family member who's going through some physical distress is be talking to me, right? You're going to want to be spending time with them because that's the person you love and care about. So it, it's just a sort of added element that makes it much more difficult when you have to come in and deal with an attorney as opposed to spending the time with the loved one. Great answer. Um, Teddy wants to know, would a trust be a proper way to protect assets? Uh, you know, you put in parentheses real estate before getting married in case of a divorce. Uh, yeah, that, that happens very frequently. And it's a little bit more um, complicated in that situation because um, it, it, it gets tricky with, with marital property in a community property state. So even though we set it up in the trust, it's separate at that point in time, but you have to be diligent and not use any community funds, i.e. any income that you generate after marriage that isn't from separate property sources. So for example, if you, let's say you have an income property, right? You put it in a trust, you want to protect it when you get married, right? And then you start doing repairs and then you use your income after marriage to make repairs right? Well, now you've commingled because remember, after you get married, 50% of every dollar you make isn't yours. It's your spouse's because this is a community property state. So setting up the trust is only one aspect of it, which is, an, is a good thing to do. But you have to make sure that you only use the income that comes from that property to pay for anything for that property. Otherwise, you have the chance of commingling the asset and giving the spouse an interest in the property. Right answer. Um, Crystal wanted to know, would you recommend having just one person as a successor trustee or is co-successor trustees recommended? Oh, who, who asked that question? Crystal? Crystal, yeah. Okay, Crystal, thank you for that question. I'm so glad she asked that question because this is something that I'm very clear and passionate about. I hate, with a passion, hate co-trustees with a passion. It is the stupidest thing ever created. 
because it always leads to problems. Always, always, always. Dumb as hell, don't do it. It's, I tell all my clients all the time, just have one person in charge who can make the decision and makes your life a lot easier. Now, let me explain why. And here's what most people don't realize about this. And I try to be a student of the game so I can bring as much knowledge as I can to the process to do the best thing I can for my clients. So let's say you like, oh yeah, it's both my kids, it's fine. I'm gonna have them be co-trustees. And you just say they're co-trustees. Now we have a problem because if you don't specify how they are to act as co-trustees, the default is the statute, right? The probate code says they have to act unanimously, okay? Now that may sound easy and we all may think we know what unanimously means, but let me give you another example, right? Let's say sibling one goes to sibling two, let's do this. Sibling two says, yes, it turns out not to be a good idea. Sibling two is like, why the hell did you do that? Sibling one says, oh, well, you said you, we could do it. It was unanimous. Sibling two says, no, I didn't. How do you prove otherwise, right? So it, it, to me, part of the co-trustee problem is just a lack of, of, of attention to detail because unless you really plot out how they act, is it reduced in writing so we have a paper trail of it, right? And then are these people gonna agree all the time? Because here's some of the questions I ask clients all the time. I, first question I ask them, who do you think your parents trust the most? Everyone always says themselves, right? Next question, do you, do you think your siblings agree? Most people always say no, right? Well, there's a problem there because you don't even agree on who your parents trust the most. How are you gonna agree on what actions you're gonna take? It just, it, I, I just don't think it is a wise idea at all. I hate it. Don't do co-trustees. Trust me. Take it from me. It's a nightmare. Okay, there you go. Clear cut answer. Uh, Ralph wants to know, are these guidelines for California only? I live in Georgia. What's up, Ralph from Georgia? Uh, well, we're not necessarily guidelines. I'm sort of giving you the law in my opinion. But yeah, this is all California. I'm only licensed in the state of California, so I couldn't advise you. As to Georgia, if you're in Georgia, I would recommend speaking to a Georgia attorney. Um, every state's laws are different, so you would want to get talk to someone local who knows the laws there and can advise you on uh, what needs to be done. Okay, Nanette, what up, Nanette? She said, uh, can you please expand on the piece of the trust before the business card of the trust? So I'm sorry, say that again? She said, can you please expand on the piece of the trust before the business card of the trust? Nanette, can you unmute and ask? Because I think we're a little confused by that. I, I think I know what you mean. Maybe the section before you covered the business card. But. Uh... Yeah, oh. it, um, I just forgot the next to last piece of the trust that you you explained. OK, right before the business card. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's OK. What I meant. Let me go back here. Sorry, one second. Thanks, Nanette. Oh, the, uh, the, the section before the business card was a pour over will. Is that, was that what you were asking about? No, I think you talked about a billfold or billable, something. I yeah, billfold cards, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me just go over that again. So, and I'll, uh, billfold cards, the best way I think about billfold cards is business cards for the trust. And let me give a little bit more detail than I gave initially to make it make a little bit more sense, right? So let's say, Let's say, Nanette, you come to me, I do your estate plan, right? So estate plan is done. Everything is protected the way it's supposed to be as of July 7th, 2021, right? Okay. Let's say six months, a year, whatever, down the line, uh, you sell this property by a new resident, right? Well, if you put it in your name, then we have that same problem, right? Because remember, it's not in the fiduciary's name, and, which means it's not in the trust, okay? So the billfold card would be something like this, right? So it'd be a little card, okay? And then with the card, what we would do is it would say Nanette, um, and I, I don't want to see the full, full last name, but let's just say Nanette, trustee of the Net Living Trust dated July 7th, 27, 2021, right? So that way, when you've got the property, you can go to escrow or title and be like, hey, here's uh, how I want to title the, the property. And now they'll title it correctly because one of the other things that's crazy um, about buying real property, it's the most expensive asset that you're ever going to buy, right? By, bar none, not even, nothing even comes close. You could buy a, a G6, it wouldn't even be close to what real property is, right? So real property is going to be the most expensive asset you buy. 
but you never get any legal advice during the process at all. Because you go to your real estate agent, your real estate agent's gonna say, I'm not an attorney. You go to escrow, escrow's gonna say, I'm not an attorney. You're gonna go to title, title's gonna say, I'm not an attorney. So never, no one ever advises you on how to take title to real property, which is crazy to me, considering how valuable and important it is to get that right. So this is one way to be able to help you in the future, should you acquire any more assets, to tell people how to title it. So that way there's less of a chance of something not being titled in the name of the trustee, which would require additional work and expense, right? Um, down the line. I hope that answers your question. Did that come close? Yep. Thank you. You hit it on the head. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Uh, Mayra wants to know, uh, she said to clarify, 401k, other retirement and IRA are not included in the trust with a question. No. So, so with 401k, um, IRAs, codes, you know, things like that, none of that stuff is going to be in the trust because it'll trigger taxation. The whole benefit of those um, accounts is they're set up by federal statutes, right? And because of the federal statutes, you don't get taxed on them. The moment that you change title to those assets, it triggers taxation. So we never want to touch tax deferred accounts in terms of putting them in the name of the trustee, um, either now or after death, because either way is going to trigger taxation, right? What you want to do is you just want to make sure your beneficiary designations are up to date because these accounts generally have payable on death beneficiaries. So we, we, what, what I would do as an estate planning attorney in that situation is I would go, okay, who do you want to have as beneficiaries on these? Who are the current beneficiaries on these? A lot of times clients don't know. So we contact the, the financial institution. We find out who the beneficiaries are. We make sure that's who they want them to be. And if not, we fill out the beneficiary designation form to change them. So it's part of the process. It's part of the estate plan but it's not something that we would title um, in the name of the trustee. Okay, perfect. So I have two questions related to price, so I'll just combine them. Uh, Larry said, what is the cost of the packages, specifically the uh, AH, CD, and POA? And then Akua said, uh, what is the basic cost of a trustee setup slash package? Okay, well, th those are two different questions. The power of attorney and advanced healthcare directive, those are very inexpensive. I mean, for those two documents, I would just charge you like, you know, a couple hundred dollars, you know, th th if, if that was all you needed. Now, if we're doing the entire estate plan, that's a different situation. That's going to be between two and three thousand dollars, depending upon single or married. But that's generally the range um, of the estate plan. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see. Oh, and that also asked, uh, how easy is it to change the person in charge of your healthcare directive and your successor trustee? Oh, that's, a, that's another good question. Then that's on a roll. So um, basically, look, here's a better way to think about it, because a lot of times, um, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm reading between the, the, the subtext of your, your question there, it's not set in stone. It's called a living trust because you can amend it as long as you're alive and you have capacity, right? So nothing that we do in the estate plan once we're done is set in stone. So let's say, for example, you wanted to give your sister your car and you and your sister fall out and you don't want to speak to her again. You can change it so she doesn't get your car. Same thing with the advanced health care directive. You can change any of this stuff at any point in time. And that's one of the reasons why I, I, I refer to this not only as after death planning, remember there's, there's three legs, right? There's lifetime planning, there's incapacity, and then there's death. This is one of the aspects that illustrates lifetime planning. You can change this at any point in time in your life. And that's why we're planning for this while you're alive. So it's not set in stone. I repeat, it's not set in stone. You can change it at any point in time that you want should the situation arise. Okay. And what's the process? Uh, for amending the trust, it, it depends on the nature of the amendment. If it's a simple amendment like, you know, I'm changing, I'm cutting out this person or I, I want to change the beneficiaries in this way, um, then that's something that's like a four or $500 charge. If it's something where we're changing the beneficiaries, we're changing the trustees, the laws have changed because it's been like four or five years, then we'll probably do an amended and restated trust so we don't have to change title to the assets. But it's in essence like doing a new estate plan. So it'd be the, the two to $3,000 cost 
that I talked about. But that's something that usually happens years after you create the trust, not like, you know, within a year or two. Okay, uh, Tanya wants to know, based on the answer you gave for commingling funds, what if your spouse signs off on the property, i.e. change title to sole property as, mar as a married woman? Would the co-mingling of funds apply in that situation? Absolutely. Title is not dispositive. Um, I, I do litigation in, in, involving wills and trusts, and this is something that comes up all the time. The person takes advantage of the elder and gets title to the property. If that was as simple as it was, then there'd be no lawsuit, right? Because they have title to the property. Title is not dispositive. What the court is going to look at is who's actually paying for the property, who put down the down payment, who's paying the property taxes, who's paying the utilities, who's paying the mortgage, who's paying the homeowner's insurance. That's what the courts are going to look at in terms of who has a, a, an equity interest in, in the property. And that's where the problem comes in because it could say, you know, your sole property, but if you're paying the mortgage with community property funds and you don't have a prenup or a transmutation, the spouse has an interest. Right. Okay. Uh, Tanya, I hope that answers your question. If not, no, no. Can I, can I ask a follow-up question on that? Please. Um, <clears throat> what if in the trust you state that the property goes to someone else in the trust and you and your husband have a joint trust, you signed off on the trust. Right. They understand the property is yours in the trust. You say that, that, that's fine. Money. That, that happens all the time, but that's a different, that's a different, question right because what we're talking about there is after both of you pass right so that's 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 a different situation but yeah you can set it up where you put it in the trust what happens because then at that point in time both parties are signing off on it right because both okay. people would sign on to the trust and this is this raises another another good point because it's really important uh tanya for blended families so you know obviously the divorce rate is really high right it's like over 60 percent under five years Right. So we're seeing more and more blended families, meaning people who have kids from prior marriages getting married to other people. Right. In those situations, it's even more important to have an estate plan in place and to have a joint one, because uh, I'm sorry, Tanya, I'm going to say it, it's true. You may not like it, but it's the truth. The second wife don't love your kids. OK, that's just the God's honest truth. I can tell you how many times I've seen a guy died, married the second wife, and she did some dastardly stuff. I mean, I don't know what the situation is because it's not her kids. She feels some kind of way. I don't know. The bottom line is if you don't have a plan in place and you're just leaving it up to the second wife, at best, it's a 50-50 shot from what I've seen. You might as well flip a coin. But if you have an estate plan in place, there's a certain type of estate plan that we can do, which is called an AB trust. Now, what an AB trust does is it becomes half of it becomes irrevocable upon the death of the first spouse. So let's go to Tanya's example, okay? So let's say Tanya and her husband, they set up a trust together, they both sign up for it. And Tanya's property that's considered her separate property, let's say it's gonna to go to her kid and that's it, right? Now, in that situation, what we can do is with an AB trust upon, let's say Tanya passes first, upon Tanya's death, Tanya's uh, property, and her interest in the community property has to be put into a separate trust and becomes irrevocable and cannot be touched depending upon the terms of the AB trust, right? That gives you protection to make sure if you have a blended family that you're, you're the second spouse doesn't omit the kid. Now, it could be a man or a woman. It's just in my experience, I've seen it more being a woman for whatever reason. But in that situation, you can protect your children from the second spouse doing any shenanigans. Thank you. Uh, Crystal had a question. So I know we're wrapping up here. We got one minute till eight o'clock. Uh, she said, does having a trust protect you slash your estate from creditors claims once you die? Uh, yes and no. I mean, there's been some changes in the law. So for example, if you had Medi-Cal, if you have a property in a trust, uh, Medic, the, the government won't come after you. So. Uh, the Secretary of State's California's, uh, excuse me, the Attorney General's Office of California used to go after people when they died for the Medi-Cal money, it's particularly if they owned a home. They don't do that anymore if the property was in a trust. Um, that's really the extent of the creditor protection with the living trust. If you want creditor protection, again, that's a higher level conversation that we need to have about how we set that up. Okay, perfect. And then, but that's a big deal though, right? Like it, 
if you because it doesn't take long to rack up hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical bills. So no, the, not at all. And so Medi-Cal for, supplements Medicare so much. So, so that change in the law, which happened a couple of years ago, was huge because I actually handled um, this is how I actually met a friend of mine who she used to work for the attorney general's office. We met on a case. And she was going after my, my client because my client inherited the property from the father who had Medi-Cal. And ultimately, you know, I tried everything I could, but at the end, I told her, look, you're going to have to pay them. And ultimately, um, she had to do that. So she had to pay off the Medi-Cal. And that was before the law changed. But now with the law, if you have a trust in place, then they won't go after you. So, you know, that's even more important for, you know, the older population who are going to be more likely to be on Medi-Cal, excuse me, Medicare, and then need that Medi-Cal supplement to help out. Wow, big time. Um, okay, got a couple more questions here before we wrap. Uh, Rapid fire. Uh, Casey said, which individuals need to be present to execute sign off on the trust? All my family members reside in another state. No, the only person who needs to be present is the person creating the trust. And then for the pour of a will, we need to have two witnesses. Usually the notary will act as one witness. So I, if I'm there, which I am there sometimes, not all the time, if I'm there for the execution, I could be the other witness. Uh, if not, I would say just find a neighbor or someone else to be the other witness for the pour of a will. Other than that, no one else needs to be there than the notary. Okay, perfect. We got two more and then we're done. Uh, Shay said, what up, Shay? She said, prompted by Ralph's question from Georgia, if I set up my plan in California but move to, let's say, Florida and something happened to me, is the estate plan still valid? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's called the full faith and credit clause, right? Like, if you get married in Florida and you go to Vegas, you ain't single. You know what I'm saying? You ain't like, woo, woo I'm single now. <laughs> no, that's not how it works, right? So it, it, it would still be valid. And you can still, you can even put Florida assets in the California trust. I, I, the way I look at it is it really depends. I, I look at it in sort of twofold. Like, where are you going to be and where are your successors going to be who are going to inherit the property, right? And then also, I would add a third question. Where, where are the assets going to be? Those would be the three things that I would look at. And wherever the bulk of those are located, I think would be the best place to, to do your estate plan. So let's say, like, the bulk of your assets and your kids are in California, but you're in Florida and you don't own property in Florida then maybe a California estate plan is worth it for you, right? It really depends. Okay, and uh, I thought we had two, we actually have two now, and one of them is really important, so I want to ask it after this, yeah. uh, and that'll be the last one. Uh, Nanette asked first, what do you charge to review trust created by other companies? Um, for what purpose? Like to see if you need a new one? I mean, uh, just it, 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 go ahead, sorry, go ahead just to make sure it was done correctly and there's nothing missing oh i mean i would i would just charge you you know hourly fee like 400 i mean there, there's a lot of it is legally used you're really just looking for key provisions right the key things that i would look for is who are the trustees who are the beneficiaries um yeah, depending on if you had minor children is there a guardianship clause right um was there a power of attorney uh, done in conjunction with it? Was there an advanced health care directive done in conjunction with it? Was there a pour of a will done in conjunction with it? Um, do you have IC, uh, uh, do you have billfold cards? Did you set up the medical ID app on your phone? Do you, you know, just stuff like that. So it, it, it would, it depends on how in depth, but it'd be probably somewhere between four and 800 bucks, something like that. Okay, and this is the, the one that I think is really important. Uh, so Michael wanted to know, so if we have LLCs or corporations, we also need to transfer those controlling shares to the trust as well. What's the risk of triggering lender actions on transfer? Oh, for, oh the, okay, I thought the question was going in a, in a different direction. No, if that's the question, then there's none, right? Because this, this is the beauty of LLCs for income property. Because read the question again, what, what's being transferred exactly? Um, Michael, if you want to unmute and just, you know, be able to articulate that yourself, that might help if you, if you can. I'm not sure if you can or not. Well, well, I'll just, I'll just say it. What Michael was saying was the ownership interest of the LLC, right? But who owns the property? It's not the people who own the LLC. It's the LLC itself, right? So that's the distinction that's being made there. And this is one of the benefits of having income property in LLCs. For all intents and purposes, the owner never changes. 
right? Because it's the LLC. It's just the people who own the LLC change. Right. Okay. All right. So that's that's pretty much it for our questions. Um, uh, Dorian, I want to thank you again for being here. If you could drop your contact info again, if you want to share it on the screen so everybody can see it. Yeah, yeah. I'll go up here. That would help. Um, also, I have okay. one. Going in. Oh, go ahead. Is that Larry? Yes, yes. Sir, um, so, sir, my name is Larry. He, what if, I mean, you have a trust, asset has been, the home has been transferred into trust. Someone died. But they mm-hmm. can't find they can't find the actual physical truck. Ooh. What happens there? Because I'm in real estate and that and Ralph has been in that situation as well. What happens if you can't find that situ- that truck, that physical trust? That's a problem. And 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 well, I, I'm gonna there's two parts to my answer. The first thing that I'll say is this is one of the reasons why I do something that no other estate planning attorney that I know of does. Okay. And I actually have just to show you guys, uh I have a stack of binders right here. These are all trust binders where I'm gonna scan the signature pages, okay? Because what I do is I scan the signature pages and I keep a uh, PDF copy because I'm a mostly paperless office, right? And then I also have this, which is a flash drive, okay? You go like this so you can see it. So this is a flash drive and I put the entire estate plan on this flash drive so that you have a digital copy of it as well. That way, we'll more than likely between myself and you having digital copies and emailing it to whoever you want and holding on to this, there'll always be a copy of it. Now, to answer your question directly, in a situation where you lose the trust, I think you're pretty much SOL um, in that situation because title is never gonna ensure the transaction. I mean, I use lawyer's title one of the best title companies in the nation. I've used them for 10 years and I use them on all my transactions and I do a lot with probate. And I can promise you no reputable title company will ensure a transaction without a copy of the trust. It just won't happen. Um, So uh, in in that situation, you're probably gonna have to probate it if you don't find the trust. I don't know what else you would do in that situation. Well, that, that's that's really important because there's so many times where I've been in a situation where the client did not find, could not find a trust. Mom died unexpectedly, did not tell the kids where the trust was, or someone might have stole it, and because they weren't in it, they read it and they weren't in right. it. Right, right. That, that situation is very. And so not, what did what did you do in those situations? How did you sell the property? You had to go through probate, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like, if you don't have a copy of the trust, like, because how? How is anyone supposed to go on anything? There's no, there's no trust document there. So we don't know who the trustees are. We don't know who the beneficiaries are. We don't know anything. So, so it's like shooting is, in the dark. Is there a remedy that something can be recorded with the, when the property is in like the law firm who created the trust so that they can go back to the source and hey, go Highly, ahead. highly, highly unlikely. And that's why I gave the first part of that answer, right? I am one of the only estate planning attorneys that I know that does this. Most estate planning attorneys, they're not going to keep them because they don't want to have the liability because, and this is sort of an antiquated thing. And this is when it, and this is why I, I made that distinction about the LLC and the ownership, right? It's attention to detail. And this is where I think I kind of set myself apart. I really try to pay attention to the detail. There's a set of statutes that govern when, as an attorney, I hold on to original estate planning documents, right? But the key word in that sentence was original, right? I don't hold on to originals. As I said, I scan the signature pages. Those are copies. None of that statutory scheme applies to me, right? So I'm able to keep copies of it and I have it backed up too. So if anything happens, I have a backup drive and I'm about to set up a cloud backup too, just to be extra, extra safe. So I have everything available. So odds are, you'll be able to get a copy of the estate plan from my office, right? Because I have it as long as I get the binder back after it's signed. And that's why I have about a stack of four binders that I have to scan and get back to clients right now uh, because I got to keep, keep them, you know, uh, keep the copy for myself and then put it on the flash drive like I was showing you here. And then I send this to the client as well with the flash drive. So no, trust me, I've done litigation and I do litigation and I've contacted numerous attorneys trying to find copies of the trust. No one, no one keeps it. No one. 
that I've talked to keeps it. I'm the only person that I know that does this because I'm doing it digitally and not with the original. There it is. So I, did, uh, I had a backup to that. So would you, rec like I have uh, four children. You recommend mm -hmm. I send a digital copy to each of them just so one of them has it if someone loses it? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's up to you because, you know, this is your personal plan. As long as you feel comfortable with it, yeah, the more copies that are out there, the better it is because, you know, in the situation that Larry just gave, and Larry's 110% Larry's right. That is not an uncommon example. I've seen that situation myself. I actually have one right now where we just had to probate it because they couldn't find the trust. So it, it's incredibly common. So, yeah, the more copies, particularly digitally, that you have, the better it is, because that's all you're going to need. If you need to sell the property, title's not going to want to see the, necessarily the original, like in hardcore form, right? They're just going to want a copy of it to make sure that they can make sure it's legit. They see what it says, and then they know that this person has the authority to sell the property. Because remember, title's ensuring the transaction, and title doesn't make nearly enough money on a transaction to risk having to insure a claim, Right. Title makes maybe two grand a pop unless it's over a million dollar property. They don't make a whole lot of money on an individual transaction. The way title makes money is they do so many transactions, right? It's a volume game. So if you have the volume like lawyer's title, yeah, you make a ton of money because you're doing 20,000 transactions a month, right? But at 2,000 a pop, you don't ever wanna to have to insure a claim. Because the moment you insure a claim, you've lost money because you're paying the attorney well in excess of $2,000 for the retainer, right? That's why title is so conservative and they've gotten more conservative year by year. I mean, I was telling people the other day, title makes those fascist far right people look like Girl Scouts, okay? Like they are not playing. They don't want zero risk. If it's even 0 0.05 risk, that's too much for these fools. So they're not going to ensure the transaction without a copy of the trust. The more copies you can spread out so if someone can get it to title, then you can sell the property. If you don't have the, the, the trust, I can guarantee you absolutely positively with no doubt, title will not ensure that transaction. Yeah. So, oh, so uh, Dorian, can you throw that contact information up for me, please? Because I got people asking yeah. for it in the chat. And, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my, my, my direct line for, for, the, for the group. Um, so oh, hold on, let me, so I'll go back to the office page and then I'll give you the, uh, direct line for the group. So that way you got, and, and on this number, you can text me as well. So I'm going to give you my direct office line where you can call me and text me. So here's the fax number, the 310-359-9202. You see it in the top part, the second number. So my direct dial is 310-359-9203. So it's the same except for 9203 at the end. So that's my direct dial for my LA office. You can call me, you can text me directly on that number. Um, it's preferable to text. I have an application on my computer where I can shoot off text, like writing an email, so I can fire off text messages really quickly. It's a much more convenient way for me to be in touch and clients like it because if I'm busy and I can't talk to you, I can still probably text you. Um, so it's a way for me to stay in touch with my clients because no one wants to be like out of communication with their attorney and they like it when they're in communication with their attorney. And I try to make sure I do that as efficiently as possible. And the text message is a very convenient way for me to do that. So just because this is this group and it's this community, I wanted to give you guys my, my direct dial. So you have it there. Um, so if you have any questions, like I said, feel free to contact me, um, and you can reach me there. Beautiful. And uh, I want to wrap it up with this guys. Um, <clears throat> first off, for those of you guys who feels like, who feel, who might feel like this is a lot that's coming at you. Um, please remember that we are all the pivot generation and I call us the pivot generation because we're the generation that's going to set our community in a new path. That, that future generations are gonna benefit from. You know, we, we might not actually be here to see the complete fruit of our labor because we're, if you look at our, our community right now, you're seeing entrepreneurship having a resurgence that you haven't seen in generations, right? You're seeing a consciousness that's starting to come about that you haven't seen in generations. That's gonna to lead to, to very significant changes going forward 
but it's not overnight, right? You're, you, the, every generation has its cross to bear. And our generation's cross to bear is the fact that a lot of times we weren't prepared. The people before us didn't know. And we got to be the ones to take responsibility to, to take this information in and apply it, right? Um, secondly, uh, to everybody in the Black community, I mean, as you can see, this brother here is very sharp, right? You don't have to always travel outside of your community to find the information that you need. You have to find experts, people who know what they're talking about. It might take you longer because, yeah, there are less of us in general because that's just the way it is. You know, we, we don't have as many attorneys and doctors and things of that nature, but there are experts who are out there. So don't give up. Just keep searching. You can find your people who look like you, who can understand uh, where you're coming from, you know, from, from a commu community-based and culture-based standpoint, right? And then number three, um, I'm going to end it with this. You guys know that I am high on transparency in this group. If I'm taking a win and I make $10,000, I bring it to you and show you because I want you to make $10,000 if you want to do something similar in a similar field. Um, if I lose $20,000, you guys know, I come in here and tell y'all, hey, I lost 20 bands on this deal. Don't do it the way I did it because I just messed up. And I'm telling you, full transparency, my family is going through right now having to deal with on the fly, not having these things in place. Right. I woke up at four o'clock in the morning to my father having a stroke. Right. I, I, I mean, I saw the man the night before we lived together. We laughing and joking. He's on his way out to go exercise that morning. He had the stroke that morning. Our life has not been the same since. That was November 20th of 2020. Yeah. When I walk in that man. kitchen, my life changed. Don't end up in my spot. Get this stuff handled now. Get it out the way and protect your family also this is for some of y'all who are going to be inheriting things you need to talk to your parents and grandparents aunts uncles yeah. whoever's going to pass stuff down to you and get this in place with them now have that conversation with them now because if not like dorian told you the court's going to run off with a part a big part of your bag if you don't yeah and let me just piggyback off that and that goes back to my point you know you all we, we tend to think that we're going to have time to set this up and we can put it off till later lord knows we don't know what's going to happen next like, like Danny just said, you can wake up and your whole world has changed. So that, that's, that's definitely one issue that we have. And I think he's right. Getting everyone to protect it is a way that we preserve the wealth and we preserve the estate. We keep it out of the courts. And that's even more important when you have high value net worth. And you may not think you have high value net worth, but if you own multiple pieces of real property, you have high value net worth. OK, and I'll say one other thing uh, for all of you who are real estate brokers or real estate agents. I work a lot in real estate because that's normally what the lawsuits are over in the trust of the states is inheriting a piece of property. So if anyone ever has any questions or, or wants me to look at title because they think it may require probate, feel free to shoot, you know, hit me up and I can look at it. And I, I'll just give you one prime example of mistakes that are made all the time. Please do not make the mistake of thinking community property is community property with right of survivorship. Those are two different things. And I've seen agents lose business behind that. If the property is titled as community property and one of the spouses is dead, you cannot sell that property. You have to go to probate, okay? If it's community property with right of survivorship, then you can sell that property. So don't make that mistake. I've seen numerous real estate agents make that mistake and it's cost them money. So I'll just leave you all with that one. Beautiful. Man. Well, hey, Dorian, we thank you so much. And, um, you know, our, our group is a solid group of people in the community looking to do things. I know a lot of them in the chat saying that they're coming to you to get their things taken care of. So I love to see that. And uh, yeah, man, thank you for everything you've done to help, you know, me and my family and, and looking forward to doing more stuff with you down the line. Most definitely appreciate you. All right, cool, man. That's, that's all I got. I'll see you guys next month. Remember, uh, head, head over to the YouTube, subscribe. The uh, replay will be up in 48 hours uh, at, at most. And make sure you follow in on Instagram at buybacktoblockla. All right, we out of here. Thank all right, you. now you have a good night. All right, y'all too.